Greetings. My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Deuteronomy, please, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I want to continue on in our uh, series I started last week on trying to raise a what I'm calling a 21st century child. I understand, as I said even last week, that not everyone here at this point in time has a child in your home, but I think that all of us would appreciate the importance of encouraging parents and grandparents and, and Awana workers and Sunday school workers and nurse, or whoever, if you're involved with children in some way, I think we need this encouragement because today's a very, very scary day in many ways to raise a child. Oftentimes I have parents say to me that they really even question sometimes whether or not they should have had children to, to bring children into this world and this kind of crazy world that it is. And I understand your feelings. I experienced many of those same kind of feelings several years ago when we were raising our girls and I really, really ex experienced those same kind of feelings now as a granddad. I don't know if because I'm older or what and I begin to look at things, but it really, it can be very scary in many ways. Yet I would encourage you this morning, Tammy and I, uh, during our years in parenting, and we were actually, we were two or three years into parenting before the Lord really began to open up our eyes to help us understand our responsibility. And what opened up our eyes to parenting, the responsibility of parenting, was that God opened up our eyes spiritually. God was doing the work in my heart, and God was doing the work in Tammy's heart. And so therefore, parenting and our marriage and everything else was really just a result of what God was doing in our hearts individually. I determined along the way, and Tammy did as well, that we were going to do everything we possibly could to help our children, to give them the strength so that they could and hopefully they would resist the godly influence of this culture and that they would choose to embrace and walk with God. We understood along the way that our children had a self-individual will as every child does. There are no guarantees. There is no magic formula. I know, I know of families. I can think of one family in particular that the man is in the ministry and... and Part of his family are just so very, very strong. And then they've got a son that's just a rebel. And they do not understand. Raised in the same house, ate the same meals. Everything's the same. And so you say, why is that? Well, it's the individual will of each, ind each person. And I guess somewhere along the way, you know, we've each got these individual temperaments. And the only thing I can conclude is that the devil finds a way to get into that particular person's life and maybe to get a stronghold in there and I I would give you encouragement as well in this if that's you right now that remember that many of us went through the same thing that doesn't that doesn't condone it and that doesn't excuse it and that doesn't cause any less worry but it was a journey right it's been a journey for many of us as well to where we're at today and so by a mother's prayers and someone else's prayers and influence God was able to work with us and help us. And finally, when we matured a little bit, our eyes opened up and we could see the truth and we chose of our own will to yield to God. And so we must continue to pray that same thing for our children, our grandchildren, for people in our church family. There are many within our church family that, that have children right now that even though they were raised under the sound of God's Word, they have chosen at this point in time in their life to walk away from it. But we've got to keep on praying for them. I, one of the things that I often shared with our daughters along the way, and Amy really seemed to latch on to it and talked about it often, is that I told them that throughout the Bible there's often been rebellious groups of people, the nation of Israel. Couldn't be any more rebellious group of people than the nation of Israel. But in the midst of that, as you read through the Bible, you read the history of mankind, you will find that God always had a remnant. And by that I mean God always had some there. And one time Elijah thought that he was the only one, but then God had to instruct him 
you're not the only one. But God always had a group there that God's hand was upon, and they stayed faithful to God. And I told our daughters, I said, no matter how bad it gets, God will always have a remnant. And what we have to make sure is that covey blood is always in that remnant. I'm going to teach you, and you're going to teach your children, and your children are going to teach their children, and we're going to pass it down from generation to generation. And I pray for the generations ahead of me right now. I don't just pray for my my children and my grandchildren. I pray for the generations. I am praying right now for them. I pray for them, and I pray that we will be able, and I know you want the same thing, to pass the faith down from one generation to the next. Very simple outline today. Point number one is this. I want us to focus on what is God's purpose for parents. If you would sit down and interview a lot of parents, and maybe even some parents that are part of our church, and you would say, give me a list of what your goals are for your children. What do you hope to accomplish? What will be success in your eyes? And I would imagine that probably many parents would say, well, I want my children to be healthy and happy and safe and comfortable. I want them to grow up to be good citizens, get a good education, come to church, and just fulfill their potential. And all that is good. But I would submit to you that that all of that is not the best. Matter of fact, there are a lot of children who obtain that. There are a lot of children who become good citizens, who get a good education, who get good jobs, but they do not know the Lord. They do not walk with God. They do not know God today. And, and there's, there's a real fear that they do not know God. They will not God, know God in the end. And so, you know, to use the words of Jesus, you know, he said, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his own soul? What will it profit your child? If they get a Ph.D. and build a new house and drive new cars, but lose their own soul. The most important thing is the child's salvation. And so we have to stay focused on that as parents and do everything we possibly can to, to help that child come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And then also, not just that, but to walk with the Lord. One of the books that I've read on parenting here recently is that it was talking about the parents that seem to really be very successful in their parenting. By successful, I mean raised children who continue to walk with God, was that the parent was able to look beyond the child's salvation to the child's discipleship. Not that the child's salvation was not important, but sometimes I think that there's some parents that think, well, if I can just get Billy or Susie to pray that prayer and be baptized, then the battle's over. And I was reading in that same book, the truth of the matter is, a child who knows the Lord has got just as many struggles as a child who doesn't know the Lord. And they still have to be discipled. They still have to be worked with and prayed for and and brought to church, but even more so, led in the home, fed in the home, guided, taught, raised up in the home. And in verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, is, is just a, the book of Deuteronomy is kind of a recap of all Moses has done, and it's his farewell address. And so he's reminding the people of everything again, and he says in verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, notice, and here's, really, here's the bottom line for life, for our children, for us, for everyone God has ever created. Here's the bottom line. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's it. There's the bottom line. And everything else builds upon that. What does that mean, to love God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? I believe that it means to love God in the very deepest inner part of our being and to have a love that is so passionate that it affects the way that we live. It's easy for us to come to church and to sing songs about loving God and go out and live like we don't. To love God with all of our heart and soul and mind and heart, it means to, to love God with such a passionate kind of way that it actually controls our business decisions. It controls what we watch on television. It controls the kind of music we listen to. It controls the way that we dress. It controls the way that we handle our money. It controls our language. You know, the other day, Tammy was saying to me, she said, why is it that there's some people, and I don't know who, I have no idea. She didn't tell me, and I didn't want to know. She said, why is it that there's some people that I know that they claim to be Christian, and she said, yet they think that they still need to hold on to just a few curse words. And I said, I don't know, but I said, if they're a parent, they do not realize the damage they're doing. 
I said, they do not realize the damage they're doing if they come to church and sing about holiness and go through all of this and hear somebody preach the way I'm preaching this morning and then the child before the days overhears us use profanity. They do not realize that that one word of profanity has probably negated everything else that's been done that day. What it will do is raise a hypocrite. It will raise a child that is lukewarm, that despises Christianity. Or to come to church and to sing worship to God and then go home and have to watch the Grammys. Or the Country Music Awards. Or whatever. We don't realize that double standard, that mixed signal that we're giving to our children. And what we're doing is raising children. We're programming them to just be lukewarm and apathetic. It's not really real. I know a while ago y'all said it was real and the preacher said it was real and you act like it was real, but now I'm watching you. Do you know that a child at best is probably only in church about 50 hours a year? But they're in the home thousands and thousands of hours every year. And so it's really what's going on in the home. It's determining what the ch way the children are turning out. Why should we be concerned about God's goals? God's goals is that we would love Him with all of our heart. Our goal sometimes is that we'd just be happy and safe, but God is that we'd love Him with all of our heart. Why should we choose God's goals over our own? Well, believe it or not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it's this, one of the primary reasons, because it's about your child's happiness. Oftentimes, and I've said the same statement myself, sometimes I hear people say, God doesn't want our children to be happy. He wants them to be holy. And I agree and disagree with that. Let me tell you why I agree and disagree with that statement. I agree that what God wants is for us and for our children to choose God over what the Bible calls the world. There's a passage in 1 John chapter 2 that Shell will bring up for us, and it says, Love not the world. Now, let me stop there for a moment. The world there is not talking about the plants, the animals. It's not, you know, God is not anti-ecology. God was green before there was green. Okay, God told Adam take care of the earth. That was part of man's responsibility was to take care of the earth. So he's not talking about the planet earth. What he's talking about is a world system, a world philosophy that says take care of self, serve self, do whatever you have to, even if it's sin, to make sure that self, self is number one. That's what it means there by the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It's wanting to exalt self. That world system. And notice now, now that you know what it means, learn us what the Bible says. Love, as a believer, love not this world system of self-gratification. Neither the things that are in the world that helps feed that self-gratification. If any man chooses to love the world, this world system, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father God, but it's of the world. And the world is going to pass away, and the lust thereof. But it's only he that doeth the will of God that's going to last forever. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says it doesn't matter what kind of house you build, or what kind of car you drive, or where you were at on the, on the sports team. The Bible says it doesn't matter because all of that is just one day just going to just go away. And the only thing that's really going to matter is whether or not you actually loved God. And so I believe that when it comes to choosing God or the world, I do believe that God would choose for us to be holy. He would choose holiness in that aspect over happiness. God would say, you have to make, sometimes, listen, following Christ, sometimes you have to make tough decisions. Children, if you're in here today and you're a child and you've made a profession of faith in Christ, will you look at me? It means for you to make tough decisions. It means you won't always be the most popular. It means, you, it means you may get picked on. You know something? They picked on your Savior. It means, that, it means that you may not be at the top in life. You know, a, a man told me many, many years ago, I heard a man say, he didn't tell me this, I just heard him say it one day. And this family, they were very, very faithful to our church, church we grew up in. He was a deacon. Uh, she played the piano. He was a Sunday school. I mean, just really committed. And, and oftentimes, you remember when they had the Chevy Vegas? You remember the little Vegas? And, and they would come to church, and this family had three or four children, a mom and a dad and three or four children, and they came to church in a Chevy Vega. It was always kind of interesting to watch them get out of the Vega. You know, it's just like, they just keep coming out of the Vega. 
one time Roger told me, he said, you know, he said, I thought one day, he said, if I took the amount of money that I give to the work of the Lord and invested it in myself, I could drive a pretty nice car. And I thought, wow, you're right. You've had to make a decision. You've had to make a decision. Are you going to support the work of God and so therefore may require a sacrifice on your part financially? And you've made it. And I thought, wow. That was big in my eyes. He taught me. I was pretty young when he, when he just said that one day in a casual conversation. I thought, wow, yeah, you have made the tough choice to do what is right. And so we have to raise our children to make the tough choice that if it's between holiness or personal happiness, then we need to choose holiness. But as I agree with that statement, God wants our children to be holy, not happy, here's how I disagree with it is because if we're not careful, that statement can imply that there is no happiness associated with holiness. Personally, I believe that the happiest people on the face of this earth are the people who choose to be holy. I believe that there is no greater joy than to choose Jesus Christ over the world. And I believe that we have to make that choice. The Bible says happy is the people whose God is the Lord. It says in Psalm chapter 1, David starts out the book of Psalms and it says this, Blessed is the man. You know what the word blessed there means? Happy. Prosperous. Well off. You want to know how to have a happy family? You want to know how to have a happy life? Here's what God says. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Basically what that is saying is, blessed is the man who chooses not to run with the crowd. But rather, his delight is in the law, the commandments of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate, and that means he thinks about them day and night. This man, this child, shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, he shall what, does the Bible say? Prosper. Now here's the problem. We believe that is in the Bible, but I don't know that we believe that is true. If we believe what the Bible says, to honor the Lord with the first fruit of all of our increase, so shall our barns be filled with plenty. If we truly believe that, We'd be ready to build a building. But we don't really believe that. We, the Bible says it, but, you know. And what we do, if it is true, and I believe with all my heart is true, God's proven to me that it's true. He has proven to me that that is true. Then what we're actually doing is shortchanging ourselves by trying to shortchange God. I don't believe that this passage means that a godly family will live a carefree life. But can I remind you that the ungodly don't either. You know, all you got to do is just turn on the television and just watch. You know, sports, sports heroes are making so much money, they have no, and their lives are just, right? There's a perfect example of people that money won't bring happiness. You watch somebody, hear somebody winning the lottery, and suddenly they got millions, millions of dollars, and nine times out of ten, their life just is destroyed. Because that kind of wealth will not bring happiness. It doesn't mean that, the, that if you live a godly life, you'll have a carefree life. What it does mean is that if you choose to live a godly life, that God will give you a joy, a joy that the world can never buy. I have never, I have dealt with a lot of families down through the years. I have ministered to a lot of families. I've been associated with a lot of Christian families over the last 25 or 30 years. And listen to me, I have yet, I could not name to you one Christian family where the husband chose to love his wife the way Christ loved the church, where the, where the wife chose to honor and dignify and respect her husband, where the parents were faithful to teach their children the Word of God, and where the children grew up to submit to their parents and to love the Lord. I cannot name you one family that did that that regrets doing it. Every family that I know that has done that they're not a carefree family, but there's a love, there's a security, there's a peace in that home. I remember many, many years ago when we first moved to Chattanooga, and, and Tammy and myself, and especially myself, we were very, very carnal. You know what I mean? Very, very fleshly, very, very worldly. When we finally left Virginia and moved to Chattanooga for me to go to school, I was 30 years old, and 
man, I was, I was there, but there's a lot of work God would have to do on my life. And I remember that this one family chose to take us in to, them, to their home. Very first Sunday we ever visited the church, they invited us over that night to come to their house. Had people over there that we could make friends with. And I remember we were going to their house, and at that point in time, Dave and Janie, and uh, you know, as I say their name, I think about when Cindy was going through all that, they were at the hospital. You know, they're in Chattanooga. They're Mexican people. I'm short, they're Mexican people, and I can look down. You know, I like to be around Dave and Janie, but, they're, but, it's, but, but Dave and Janie, I remember when we first started going, they would invite us over to their house. And you know something? This, this is fanatical. They did not have a television. And they just played Christian music. And Tammy and I went in there like, wow. They're like, what? And they're like, shh. You can just feel the presence of God in that home. Now, I'm not telling you to go home and get rid of your television, but you know, I heard Chip Ingram say the other day, he challenged the people five days, and he said, you won't survive five days. He said, try it three days. wonder what would happen to us if we would choose to turn off the world for three days and turn on God. wonder what would happen in our homes. You know, I don't believe, and you know this as well, money can't buy happiness. It can't. The book of, there's many words of wisdom on this, the book of Psalms, the book of Proverbs. I chose just a, a few. It says in Psalm 37, verse 16, notice, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. You want to be the happiest person in the community? Choose to be a righteous family. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasures and trouble therewith. Go ahead and work all those extra hours. See if it brings happiness. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Next slide. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. The Bible says if you really want to be happy, you're better off really with little. If you have to make a choice between trying to build this this castle or focusing on your family and living in a cottage the Bible says you will be better off to choose to live in a cottage with God than in a castle without God God's purpose for parents is number one for them to love God with all of their heart and then secondly very simply to pass down that love to their children I believe that happiness true happiness comes from holiness. Let me say that again. I believe that true happiness comes from holiness. I don't believe that you can be any happier in your life than when you're walking really, really close to God. And when we allow ourselves to be distracted and pulled away from that, we're robbing ourselves of just a pure, simple, sweet happiness of God. Raising children to love God, to choose holiness over this personal happiness. It's not easy, isn't it? It's very, very difficult. And that's why the Lord gives you at least 18 years to try to do it. It takes a lot of what I'm going to say is very intentional effort. This uh, past week, I picked up a couple more books on parenting. One was a small-like book, and so actually I sat down and read it in one evening. It was such a good book, I was just pulled into it. And he said a couple of things there that really, I thought might be a word of encouragement to you, especially if you're struggling in your parenting. You're, because you've tried and it didn't work, or you're trying right now and it's very difficult. He said a couple of things, and I want to share them with you. Number one is this. He said that God is more concerned with the direction of parenting than he is the perfection of parenting. You're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be a perfect parent and you're not going to be a perfect home, and you're not going to raise perfect children. But make sure you're going in the right direction. Secondly, I thought this was very good. Actually, he quoted Gracie Allen from this. Never place a period where God has a comma. 
That's something to think about if you're parenting a child right now that's rebellious. Don't put a period where God has a comma. Stay focused. Keep praying. Don't give up. To your dying breath, do all that you can to be used by God to help that child come to know and walk with the Lord. If you're in the very midst of parenting right now, look at verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Here is just some very, very simple instructions on parenting. Probably the best instructions in all the Bible, believe it or not, back in the book of Deuteronomy. Verse 6 says, And these words, that is the commandments, the law of God, which I command thee this day, first of all, as an adult shall be in thine heart, and then once it's in your heart, then you shall turn around and teach them diligently unto thy children. What does it mean to teach them diligently? Sometimes I have parents say to me, they'll say, I just, you know, the child does something wrong, and the parent will just say, I just don't understand. They know better than that. Why are they not doing it? Do you know why your children don't always do what they should? Because they're children. Here's one of the things that I think that I, I, I learned through parenting. A child's mind, first of all, a child's mind is not fully yet developed. It's in the process of developing. And by that I mean that in a, chi- a child's mind is not really yet to think in an abstract kind of way, and what I mean by that is to be able to see both sides at the same time. We can do that as adults. But it took us a long time to get to that point. We're able to see the pros and the consequences. We're able to see both sides. A child's mind is not yet able to do that. A child's mind is still developing. That was one of the things I learned first in parenting. Here's the second thing I learned. It's not a whole lot better when they're a teenager. It's growing... It's developing, it's changing, but it's not there yet. Matter of fact, and I'm going to make a lot of enemies, sometimes it's not even there in the 20s. Not fully. And I tell you, I'll prove that to you. Because all you've got to do is watch and you'll see some 20-some-year-old. You know, a 20-some-year-old will look right square in a gun and, and with a bullet in and not flinch. That says to me, you don't understand what it's all, you don't understand. If you can look at a gun and not flinch, if you can play with danger, if you can drive recklessly, that's what I mean by this, if you can drive foolishly, recklessly, and you don't think, you don't understand. You don't understand that not only could you kill yourself, you could kill somebody else. And I think that, and I don't, I'm not trying to put down teens and 20s, but I'm, what I'm saying is, is that it takes a while for someone, and I was the same way. And I'll, you know, and I'm, I'm a guy, probably it takes us boys a little longer than it does the girls. There's just a sense of adventure in us, and we're just, you know, just going to do it and do some very, very foolish things. How many of you did some foolish things even in your 20s? So, you know, I mean, so we've got to keep that in mind. And the reason I say, emphasize all of this is because what I see is a lot, I see a lot of parents, and I know it's fear. A lot of parents, because they're afraid, they don't know what to say, they don't know what to do, and once that child reaches a certain age, a teenage year, the, the parent, especially us dads, think, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to say, and we get out of the picture. We kind of, we're still there, we still love our family as much as we ever loved them, but we're not involved in our family because we're thinking, well, I don't know what to do and I'm afraid I'll do the wrong thing and I don't know how to communicate and so therefore I'm just going to kind of stand on the side and hope that it'll all work out. And it will not work out from hoping. The only way I believe that a person will raise a child who loves God in this world today is that that parent, mom, and dad have got to be very, very intentional. That child and raising that child to know God has really got to be their number one priority. And it's going to take, therefore, I, I, heard, I read this little story this week, a sad little story. But I thought, wow, this, this little girl was in a kindergarten class. And this is a true story. This little girl was in a kindergarten class, and they allowed the kids in kindergarten to draw this picture of their family and to color it in. And then they were actually going to take this picture that they had drawn, and they were going to decoupage it and put it on a plate. And they were going to make this really this, you know, child's keepsake 
of their family that they could bring home and display in their house. Here's my family. And this one little girl, as she was doing her family, she put in her picture, she drew herself, and then she drew beside herself, she drew her little dog, and then beside that she drew her mommy, and she even drew the baby that was in her mommy's belly. And she brought her plate home. The only problem was her mom and dad were not divorced. Her dad was so busy making money that the little, in her innocency, the little girl didn't even put him in the picture. And this man, this book that I read, he said, you know, dads, we've got to get in the picture. It's your family. It's your flesh and blood. The most important thing on life, this earth to you, should be your children. So you've got to make sure you're in the picture. That means involvement with them. They're kids. They're still growing. It's going to take a lot of work. They're struggling. But we have to be there. And to teach them diligently means an ongoing, repetitive process. It's actually the word that is used if you were sharpening a knife. If you were sharpening a knife, you know, when you first buy a knife, a knife's really sharp. But then after you use it two or three times, a knife is no longer sharp. And so how do you get that knife back sharp? You have to wet that knife. Can you just that? Is that a sharp knife? I don't care what they advertise on television. That doesn't sharpen the knife, does it? The wedding process of repetitively over and over and over. And teach them. This is the word that God chose to use to talk about the parenting process. Wetting the knife over and over and over again. Going over and over until it is drilled, if you will, not just into their heads but into their hearts. Be faithful. Be consistent in this. He says you shall teach them diligently. And then notice what he says in verse 7. This, it's not just an evening lecture here. But he says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shall what? Talk of them. The word right there, talk, is not the word that would be used for a lecture. It's the word that is used there for common, ordinary, everyday conversation. Here's one of the problems that we make sometimes as parents. As long as everything is going good, don't rock the boat and just let it go. And then when something goes bad in a moment of anger and a fit, then we're going to straighten everything out in anger and the child's anger and we're in that, in that moment of turmoil, then we're going to try to straighten it out. But let me ask you a question. How receptive are you to instruction when you're mad? Not very receptive, are you? The Spirit is closed. And actually the Spirit has to be reopened before we can receive instruction. The same way for our children. Just little adults. And so, yes, there may be a time for a lecture, and we're going to talk about that in another lesson. And there may be a time for discipline. We're going to talk about that. But, but parenting has to be more than in a moment of turmoil to be effective. What it means here, he says, probably the most effective is just in the common, ordinary, everyday relationship with the child. You know, they say that one of the great problems in our world today is that there was a time period up until just maybe a century ago that predominantly the family, the family was right there on the farm. The mom was there at home and she took care of the family there on the farm and oftentimes I was raised on a farm and oftentimes the dad worked the farm and so there was this interaction with the children, there was this interaction with the family all the time. Whereas today, you know, we're just all just running in every direction that there's really no interaction. Even as a family, we're waiting for somebody else. You know, Mr. Rogers is going to raise our children. At least reruns in Sesame Street. Yeah, they can learn some values, but that is not, they won't learn biblical values. He says, notice verse 7. Here's what you do. You talk to them. Notice what he says. When you sit us in thine house. So in other words, what? Let's just bring it down to common language. When you're just sitting around. You're talking about God and His Word. When you're sitting around. When you're out walking in the way. When you're out going somewhere doing something. When thou liest down before you go to bed at night. And then when you get back up the next morning. What he's talking about is, is that weave the Word of God into everyday living. Here's what I believe would be the best scenario of helping a child to, to learn to know God and to embrace God would be this, 
this conversation that a parent is having with a child while they together are working on something and the parent is talking to the child and the child is actually asking questions. One of the best things for a child to do is to ask questions. You know what I... You know what the question I ask when I'm studying the Bible? You know what the predominant question I ask myself? Why? Now if I know why, I'll probably embrace it. But until I, I'm stubborn, until I know why... I probably won't. And I'll tell you something. Children need to know more than just what. They need to know why. So that when the choice is left up to them, they will choose the better thing. They know why they should do it. Someone said this, and I thought it was really good. Read Bible stories to your children, and as you're doing it, put your child right in the middle of the Bible story, and after you've read the Bible story, say, so what would you do if you were in their shoes? And then talk with them, explain to them the biblical principles. The Bible teaches us that one of the great ways of learning God's Word is that we have to meditate upon God's Word. What does it mean to meditate? To meditate upon God's Word means to take it in and to mull it over, to chew it over, to digest it into your system. You know, just as like we as parents, when our children are very small, we have to cut their food up for them so that they can take it and ingest it and digest it into their system we as parents really are there to facilitate them meditating on the Word of God. Understand what I'm saying? We help them meditate on the... They don't, they're not yet able to think in this. The, the abstract, the both sides, they're not able yet to do that. It's our responsibility to, to teach them how to see both sides, the pros and the cons, how to take it, how to apply that to their lives. Someone would say, but isn't the Bible old and outdated and irre irrelevant? You know, I think that one of the reasons, listen to me very carefully. Wives and children, listen to me very, very carefully. I believe that one of the reasons that a lot of men do not, and I always hear about being a, a man being a spiritual leader. I hear a lot about this. And I believe that one of the reasons Men sometimes do not do that because it's easier just to stay silent than it is to take the risk of the family rolling their eyes and slouching down. <sighs> Listen, you want to stop a man from doing something, you just do that to him. Right, guys? Something he especially doesn't want to do. It's not his, it's not his territory to... He's not as communicative. His, his communication skills are not as much as the woman's is. That's not just a joke. That's truth. And so he's already apprehensive about doing this, and he gets ready to try to do it, and when he gets ready to try to do it, the family's too busy. Men, what will you do next time if that happens? It won't be a next time, will they? It's easier for me just to stand back you know, I had a family, they're, they're divorced now. I had a family come to me and I've spent, and spent time trying to counsel with that family. And that wife would just sit right there and berate her husband right in front of me. And I'm thinking, so you think this is going to turn him around? <laughs> we used to have a wife in Ohio. She would come to church all the time and she would, she would tell all the rest of the ladies how bad her husband was. Until one day one of our staff wives pulled her to the side and said, let me tell you something, honey, he ain't never going to come to church until you shut up. There's no way that man will ever step inside of a church door if he knows that you've already painted, told everybody in the church who he is and how bad he is. A lot of men are nodding their heads here right now. And it's, it's difficult. It is hard. It is risky. Especially if your children are a little older right now. It is risky to try to take this chance. It's, that's why you've got to start out as young as you possibly can. The younger you start out, the easier it will be. Do you want to know something? Psychologists have said that by the time a child is beginning to understand language, they're already internalizing their values. So as soon as you can, Families, especially dads, as soon as you can, you need to start out as early as you possibly can. If it gets down the road some, it's going to be a little bit harder. 
And what I would recommend you do is just sit down in front of your family and say, listen, I, this is not comfortable for me to do this, but I want you to know something. I love God and I love you and I want us to read the Bible together and I want us to have a word of prayer together as a family. For the sake of heaven, do that. And wives and children, when they do that, you need to say, you're better than Pastor Terry. That was great. Thank you for doing that with us. It's a great risk, but look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. The risk is worth taking. I always choose the verse of Scripture that we read Pastor Zach has us to read together because I'm trying to show you the direction that we're going. And look at verse 5 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 5 says, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. You want, to, you, want to, you want your child to succeed out on the job when they go out to get a job? Can I tell you how to make your, help your child succeed when they go out and get a job? Teach them to embrace the wisdom of God's Word. And Because I, I, I guarantee you, for every thousand... You can't hire a good worker nowadays. You can't hire somebody that will come to work on time, that will be honest, that will just put their new, nose to the ground and do... You can't hire somebody to do that anymore. And so therefore, when they can find somebody that will do it because they're under control, they've got the wisdom of God in their life, when they've embraced these eternal truths, then that is a wise child. And they will excel in life. They will succeed. The employer, even if the employer doesn't like Christianity, he will like their work ethic. That is the reason that you've got to do it. To prepare that child for life. How do you do it? How do you do this? Let me tell you this very quickly. I think one of the best ways to start out in this, especially if your children are very small, you've got children, you know, under the age, school age, just take a Bible story book and read to them. And talk to them about the Bible story. That's why I give every Father's Day, that's why I give Bible story books now to the new dads. Because I want those new dads to just take that simple Bible story book and read their child a Bible story and talk with them about that. And so, you know, Billy, how do you... Give me, Billy, I'm not picking on you, but, you know, how would you feel if your mom took you and put you in a basket and you were... Why do you think your, his mom did that? Do you think his mom was afraid? What might she have been afraid of? Ah, oh, the crocodiles would get him. Yeah! But why was she really not afraid? Because she knew God would be with him. God would help him. What's, what's he learning? You can trust God. It's just that simple, folks. The problem is not that it's hard. The problem is we just don't want to do it. We won't take the time to do it. It's really very, very simple. Something I've ordered, I, will hope, I was hoping that they would be here today, and they're not. But I'm going to start having for us as a church family, and they come once a quarter. They're called Keys for Kids. We use those. If you're talking about elementary age kids, we used to use those, and it's just a devotional. It'll have a verse of Scripture. It'll have a Bible story, and you can just read that with them. And we would have devotions every morning. I won't say every morning. Most every morning. Before our girls would head off to school, we would pause there for a few minutes. Listen, they had to get up early enough to, to at least give us 10 minutes to have devotions. I, I can tell you how to get your children up early in the mornings. If your child won't get out of bed, can I tell you how to get your child out of bed? Make them start going to bed earlier. And I would say, you know, you have a hard time getting up in the morning, tell you what. You're not getting enough rest. You're going to go to bed at 8.30 tonight. And if 8.30 doesn't work, 8 o'clock is going to work. That's, that's abusive, isn't it? No. Cindy, one of Cindy's, she's going to go to the grave of the story. 
Cindy says that I told her one time, and I guess I did, I mean, I'm sure, I was, you know, I told her, she was wanting to go somewhere, she was a teenager, and her room was just a zoo. And I said, I want you to clean your room up before you go. Well, I walked, she left, and I went in and I looked, and her, she had not done a thing. So you know what I did? This is what she says I did, I guess I did it. I'm a morning person. Are you, are you catching where we're going here? She says, I couldn't believe it. You came in 5 o'clock the next morning and turned on the light and said, it's time to clean up your room. You all know something? I never had to tell her another time to have to clean up your room, and she didn't do it. It's not really, you know. You can get the message across and not have to be abusive. Have that family keys for kids. Bible storybooks, keys for kids. By the time they reach the teen years, our, your teens should be starting to learn how to, how to have devotions on their own. Nevertheless, you still need to be involved with them. You need to know what they're doing. You need to talk with them. You need to interact with them. You need to not only know what they're doing in their devotions, you need to begin to, you're, pass, you're, you're, you're slowly letting go of the control of them. You're telling them what you're learning in your devotions. And I tell you, it can even go on to when they leave home. One of my greatest joys and I was scared to do this two or three years ago because I was thinking, my family's going to roll their eyes at me and think, come on, we're on vacation. A few years ago, we went on vacation together. And uh, I think Cindy and Jeremiah were married, but Josh and Amy were not yet. I can't remember exactly. And we were all there kind of on vacation together. And I told him, I said, here's what I want you to do. I said, I'll take the first night, and I want each of you just have about a five-minute devotion each night. Now I thought they were going to think, I'm not doing that. It, it is one of the highlights of my parenting years to hear my daughters express to the rest of the family what they believe. And then to hear our son-in-laws talk about that. He said, ah, oh, we can't do that. Yes, you can if you will get started and just do the work, you, yes, you can get it to that point. We were not a perfect family. One of the messages I'm going to preach to you is about apologizing to your children. I had to do a whole lot. I think there would be a whole lot of families reconciled if the parents would go and apologize. I had to go and apologize several times to my girls. When I asked them to write down ten things that changed their life, you know what they listed? One of the ten things is that you were willing to come and apologize to us when you had done something wrong. I'm talking about just real down-to-earth relationship Christianity with the children.